Hello everyone. My name is Geeta. I'm the head of cinemas here at ACME. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners, the people of the Kulin Nation, on whose land we meet tonight, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I also extend my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here with us tonight and from those all around the nation of this land. A huge welcome to Acme Cinemas for the first of three events we are running this weekend with leading cinematographer and director Warwick Thornton. These events run as part of Acme's Melbourne Winter Masterpieces exhibition, Light, Works from the Tate Collection, where we are spotlighting the work of two Australian cinematographers who have mastered the technical language of light and turned it into an art form, cinema. We have Warwick with us all weekend, and later in November, we'll welcome Oscar nominee Ari Wagner to the stage to talk about her, um, how she shot The Power of the Dog and some of her other works. Alongside tonight's In Conversation, Warwick will also be introducing two double bills at ACME this weekend, pairing his own works with films that have inspired his cinematography practice. Warwick's Sweet Country and Jim Jamush's Down by Law play from 12 p.m. tomorrow. And Warwick Samson and Delilah and Vim Vendor's Paris, Texas play from 3 p.m. on Sunday. Most of these screen in 35 millimeter and Warwick will introduce all four films. So please do join us if you're free and you like. We've also prepared a Warwick Thornton shelf on our on-demand cinema platform, Cinema 3, which features most of the short films that will be mentioned in tonight's conversation. We've made those available to watch for free alongside some of Warwick's feature films for the next 30 days. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, please Google Acme Cinema 3 or you can find it via our homepage if you're not already familiar with that excellent digital library. I want to thank both my film programs team and the many, many people, tech, bio, AV, marketing, comms, and otherwise who have worked behind the scenes quite literally here at ACME for their work on this, on this event. I'd especially like to acknowledge Trace Armstrong from my team for her instrumental input. And now for the reason you're actually here, our guests this evening. Warwick Thornton is a Caytage man born and raised in Alice Springs, whose de debut feature film as director, Samson and Delilah, won the coveted Camera d'Or at the 2009 Cannes International Film Festival. Thornton was also that film's cinematographer and he has a prolific practice in this field. Alongside Samson and Delilah, he has lensed most of his films, including Sweet Country and television series, including Mystery Road and Firebite. Alongside cinematography for other celebrated directors, including Rachel Perkins' Radiance and Wayne Blair's The Sapphires. I'm thrilled to wake, welcome him to ACME tonight to speak with Australia's favourite film critic, Margaret Pomerantz, who most of you know, co-hosted the movie show with David Stratton on SBS and ABC for almost 30 years, followed by Screen on Foxtel Arts with Graham Blundell until last year. And today she continues to deliver her always entertaining reviews on the weekly with Charlie Pickering on the ABC. Thank you for indulging my very long intro and please join me in welcoming Warwick and Margaret to the stage. My first question is, your identity as a First Nations mm. filmmaker. Oh, here we go. Well, no, I mean, <laughs> what does that mean to you and, and what is oh. the responsibility attached to that? Um, you know, I could be a plumber. I've decided to be a, 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 a cinematographer, um, writer, um, village idiot. I can always get rid of that, but I can't get rid of being Aboriginal. You know what I mean? So that's just the way it is. It's purely who I am and that's where I come from and what I love and it's very special, you know? Um, so yeah, it's sort of... <sighs> storytelling is in all of us. Um, filmmaking is in all of us if we want but who we are and where we come from and our blood and what you know our, our our ancestry is something that i uh, you know you can't have a shower and get rid of that one but you can if you you can have a shower and get rid of directing 
No, I don't think you can. Um, not yet. <laughs> yeah, not yet. It's um, it's a yeah, it's a funny old. The, the the most interesting thing is I, I started off as a cinematographer, you know, camera assistant and um, camera trainee in Alice Springs at Karma. And I actually started writing movies, short films to, to, to shoot. And you know, I started writing things that I I've, I wanted to wanted to shoot because cinematography was all encumbersome, and and I wanted to be the greatest cinematographer ever. And so, and no one was ringing me to shoot their films, so I went, oh, all right, I'll start writing. And um, and then they were sent into the, you know, into the funding bodies, especially with shorts. And um, and they said, oh, we love the script, but uh, you're gonna have to direct it. And it's like, no, oh, I don't want to direct. I don't want to direct, that's way too hard. Um, and so that's kind of, I went kicking and screaming into directing purely to get these films up so that I could shoot them. Um, and I've worked out now, and this is really sad, but the director and the writer in me stay at home with a candle and a pen and a, pe a pencil and a piece of paper and they they scribe out all night these scripts going do you think he'll like it do you think he'll like it while the cinematographer in me is at the pub <laughs> and he's drunk and he's dancing on the pool tables and this poor director and this poor writer is sitting there going oh Oh, we, we need to put more visual storytelling in this because he, he'll get upset when he comes home drunk. <laughs> <laughs> and so they scribe all night and I, and then the, the cinematographer the, with the ego comes swanning through the door and goes, what's going on? And they go, oh, we've written this stuff. We think you will really like it. And it's like, oh, I'll, I'll read it tomorrow. I'm too drunk right now. And it's kind of this, I think my journey in life is the director and writer in me is purely there to keep this cinematographer happy so you know and keep his ego burning and you know yeah that's kind of the that's the weird um realization i have is sort of well it fits in writing writing's ridiculously painful i know and You've i can't spell you know I, I left school before year eight i can't spell and i don't care you know what i mean I, and i write with pen and paper i don't own a computer i've got an ipad just to watch movies on but um so it's like, it's like this archaic kind of world I live in and then directing is so painful and it's all full of, you know, for me as a director, everything's a compromise to have to keep this creati creativity alive for this dead uh, cinematographer. You know what I mean? And it's just painful and it's a slog and it's having to answer questions within with a 30 you know with a five second sound bite within 30 seconds to keep the whole film moving forward and then this dop that it's all you know uh, um it's all for this idiot anyway well you know i mean we're going to go to a clip from your first film as director which is payback yeah which you were you Cinematographer, black and white, yeah. Yeah, yeah why black, black and, and white? white? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, the funny thing with black and white, that I've, and the funny thing with black and white is such a, it is such an auteur-y kind of wank, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's really that vanity credit, like that f a film by, which I try and get rid of every time, but the, the sad thing is that if you put a film by Warwick Thornton, you kind of get an ex you get more people to watch it, you know what I mean? And it's it's really sad. I try I try to always get rid of a film by Warwick Thornton because it's, I don't it, like it either. But it's, anyway, it's, it's first, everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, not you. But no, I mean. no, no. Yeah, so, <laughs> no, no. It Everybody. is. You know what I mean? But it's actually publicists and and promoters who yeah. actually really push for that more so than directors. That mind you, there's there's a couple of directors out there who's like it have, it's in the contract. It has to say film by. But um. But, but listen, I think this is interesting because we were talking earlier, mm. and you know you were talking about being inspired by Down By Law yeah. for this film. Can you talk about... Absolutely. That? Absolutely. Will we see a little bit of it first? Yeah, okay. All right, can we roll the clip from Payback? First, first short film. <laughs> That's George Wombo from the lead singer from Warmby Van. 
he finished up. All oh, beautiful. I um, I'd, I'd seen. You know, I went through film school before making that. I never at, at film school. I I went there for cinematography, and I went there for three years, and never had an inkling in um, directing. You know what I mean? That's just way too hard. And obviously, the ego of being a cinematographer was much more important. You know what I mean? And and I, I'd seen Down by Law, uh, obviously. At, no, I think I'd seen it before film school, maybe in the uh, really early nineties. And I didn't emulate. I, I totally emulated, but I didn't do it on purpose. In in a way, there's so much about that. It's it, it's only ten minutes long. But there's so much about that that is just completely just taken from Down by Law and Robbie Mueller, the cinematographer who did Down by Law, who actually did both films. Robbie Mueller did uh, Paris, Texas as well. He's just my total hero as as cinematography goes. And if you kind of, when you start backdating and start looking at your old stuff and you start looking at the stuff that you, you, you really love, you just see these beautiful natural progressions of who you are and what inspires you and it being really profoundly visual in what your works are and who the people and the cinema that you've, re you've always really, really loved. You know, and I'll, I'm a f firm believer in when you start off in, in, in storytelling, just emulate. Emulate your most favourite writers, directors, cinematographers, because that's what you want to do. You know what I mean? You want to be like them. And then slowly, the more you do, the more you get your own voice and you start doing what you need to do, you know what I mean? But just to, you know, you know, there's, there's no geniuses in this in this world from day one. It's hard work and a natural progression of emulations that turn into you being so comfortable with who you are and how you work and how you feel. And with that sort of knowledge and comfortability become, you know, you be become slightly fearless and then you start getting your own voice. So I, I'm a firm believer in just copy the, copy the films that you love until you love the films that you're making and then your, your voice. Yeah. Well, you talk about meeting Robbie Miller and Vin Vendors at a very young age. Yeah, yeah, 17. I was a camera assistant, uh, camera trainee in Alice Springs. You know, just loading bits of 35 mil and learning how to use a beta cam and that. And Vin Vendors and Robbie Mueller rocked up to... Firstly, they rocked up to do, just do some scouting for a film they were doing called Until the End of the World, which was, I think was a big budget Vin Vendors film. Yeah, it was, it was huge and very problematic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hugely. Yeah, totally. John Hurt? Was it John, John, was it John Hurt? Was the actor in it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it had a zillion producers on it. Of course it did, yeah. Like every million is another three producers, I think is how, how it works. Yeah. And you, you'll never meet all of them, you know what I mean? Um, even <laughs> none of them come to set. Um, but, but, you know, the interesting thing, going back to payback, I mean, it's sort of like white justice and then indigenous justice. Yeah, yeah. And the, the, the quick, the, the, you know, 30 years in jail and, and, then, um, and then a really, really which is sort of like a long-term sort of torture. And then five minutes in a car park and you get stabbed, stabbed, you know, 20 times in the legs and it's kind of like the different version of torture. You know what I mean? I mean, incarceration, is that good for, you know, you know, does it turn you into more of an animal than it does, you know? No, but I mean, the stabbing is done by, you know... The family, yeah. of the actual yeah. father, in that film, the... the he gets stabbed by his father and his brother for doing the wrong thing to the family. So, you know, it's a different version. Yeah, of, yeah. but it is, it's sort of like, it's an interesting look at, you know, the indigenous sense of justice and the white sense of justice. Yeah, it's a funny old one. That, that came from, that, that kind of, the idea of that film came from 60 Minutes going into a community to witness a payback. And rather than them being neutral, they chose the side of the actual perpetrator, you know what I mean? And then suddenly the, the family and the community felt that they were ostracised because it was kind of like this barbaric thing. And they only, you know, talk about, you know, how journalism is supposed to be balanced, you know what I mean? It's like they did not spend any time with the actual 
the, the, the community or the actual family who are undertaking the payback. They just they stuck to one side, which was quite a quite an interesting. You know what I mean? It's sort of like it's difficult to. If you're gonna do it, do it properly. Is what I'm kind of saying. Anyway, and look, and talk to both families and talk to both laws. And you know, anyway, yeah. Um, um, there was an exhibition that you did, had at the Anna Schwartz Gallery. The future is unforgiving. Huh? And well, well, you draw it. I mean, your. Your work is political. That's an incredibly political uh, Just being, as an Indigenous person, being alive is kind of political. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's kind of like we've been trying to be shot out, uh, poisoned out, um, burnt out, bred out. You know what I mean? So actually, Aboriginal people today are actually a political statement that we're still here. So, you know, it's kind of... So, and you have to take that and use that. You know what I mean? And I have a voice. I have a, I have, people have opened doors for me as a... Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's important to use that voice. What's the responsibility to your community, having that voice? I get in trouble all the time. Um, <laughs> I but, thought you might. <laughs> yeah, I get in trouble all the time. But, but you know, the, the, kicking against the pricks is, you know, our, our communities have, can get into cycles of, you know, certain things and and think of reality is different and you've sometimes got to slap your own community and say, come on, you know what I mean? Samson Delilah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Is, is an exact example of that. You know, I had to make sure that with Samson Delilah there was nothing in that film that I hadn't seen personally, so no one can say did, that doesn't happen. We're getting to Samson and Delilah. Oh, I'll shut up then. I'll no, no, you don't have to shut up. But I, uh, <coughs> what I wanted to do was, because there is a mischievous in you, mischievousness in you, yeah. that, uh, as well as a great seriousness, and I wanted to show a clip from Mimi, which I haven't seen forever and it's yeah. one of your short films but it's sort of like um it's a mi mischievous one yeah okay can we have a just a look oh these are the, oh, the oh, these are the <coughs> images from the from the gallery yeah from and Anna's, it, Anna's, the show and it's uh, like Anna. suicide vests well sugar kills more people more indigenous people than any terrorists so come on you know what i mean are, are, are they t people alcohol sugar are they you know where, where does big corporation fit into um the death of us humans, anyway. Well, that's no, good. That's it's a, a very that's, that's powerful a image version of that. To, <laughs> to make a point. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to move on. Young Aaron Patterson. Yeah. Young Sophie Lee. Yeah. Can we have a look at that clip from Mimi? Yeah, that's <laughs> I mean, it's gorgeous. Oh, it's so film. clunky. I look at that and I'm, I just, you know, it's my first foray into cultural clunky comedy <laughs> and well I, I think, think it works yeah hey is it yeah no I don't it, well, you know I don't, I don't is know is it that the least of your films is it it's the one yeah it's the one I just sort of I, I wanted to be as naughty as possible and I don't think I got it right you know what I mean mm -hmm. oh. but anyway all good I thought it was I thought it practice. was very entertaining practice it's now, practice one practice, now, practice painting but Jilly Gibson and I, she passed some years ago, as in a lot of your work, she's in your award-winning short, Nana. Yeah, yeah, Mitchell. She's yeah. also in Samson and Delilah. Yeah. Um, and in Nana particularly, she plays this very strong woman. Yeah. Now, you had a very strong woman in your life, in your mother. Oh, always, always. I have, I have my, my sisters and my mother. I, you know, I have I two, two ratbag brothers and, and two sisters and a mother who, you know, who are incredibly powerful and empowering and Amazonic and put the food on the table. You know, you really recognise pretty quickly who's doing, you know, the business and creating the law in, 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 in my household and it was the, it was the, it was the women, so it was... So is that important in your work to represent you know, women strongly? I, because I even not, in Samson and Delilah, to, Delilah's not, the strong one. Yeah, totally. I try not to write for it. It's just, it's just inherent, I think. Right. You know what I mean? I'm like, oh, I'm going to write for some powerful women. It's like, just happens that way. Right. It's just natural, you know what I mean? 
Well, we have a look at Nana, a little clip from Nana. And it's this is very right. short. I think that for me, this is getting sort of cultural comedy um, right. This is, I, I, I love this film. This is one of my favourite things I've ever made in my it's entire life. Very and it's very all It's all really based on Sesame Street in a way. You know what I mean? But, you know what I mean? It's, it's based on a little girl going, you know, I love, you know, I love my now. But um, can I just say that for anyone who is Indigenous in the audience, you know, we are looking at images from a person who is no longer with us. So. Yeah, but well, we've got permission. We, we have, have yeah, we've permission, got permission from, from the family. For all, all the clips in these. Because that was, that was, that was Gopalul before. He yeah. pa- passed away as well, yeah. you know, from the last film. You know, yeah, but. I've forgotten about him and that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, can we roll the clip from Nana? Oh, Mitchell, I miss her. Yeah. Mm. She was such a great presence on... On screen. We'll talk about that later. Now, a, and a lot rat bag, a rock star rat bag. Yeah. 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 She just, you know, really grabbed up the screen. Yeah. Didn't she? Yeah. Um, a lot of your work is very personal, and I, you know, one of my favourites is Greenbush, which is about um, a, an Aboriginal um, radio station. Uh, yeah. It's like a fortress shelter out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And... Um, well, the really interesting thing happened in the... I think it was in the... It was in the 80s so the federal government decided that, um, okay, all every Aboriginal community needs this thing called a BRAX, which is a remote a recording to, you know, help... Like a little radio station in a, in, a, in, a, in a little donger, a little portable thing. And so everyone got one. And it was interesting because it was like, well... A lot of people needed health clinics and and um, schools, not little radio stations in a strange way. So they turned them into what they needed them to be. And, you know, something like Greenbush is about turning uh, something that is necessary and really important, but turning it into what the community needs, which is much more important. Which is a community centre, yeah, really. Yeah, no, a community centre, yeah, absolutely. And, and actually, I mean, we can... And, and this... Also, um, we've got to be careful about this too because this is uh, starring David Page, uh, who is also no longer with us. So, and the Page family are, are very. No, yeah, they're cool. Yeah, they're cool about yeah, this. Stephen's cool and everyone's cool. Yeah. So, can we. Oh, this is, I actually, this is my job. I used to do this job, Greenbush. Yeah, well, we were going when to talk about that before. We go to the clip because you were, you actually did this job. Yeah, when I was 16, 17, you know, with the home of awesome nepotism from my mother who, who started Karma, I, you know, it's like I left school and she's like, well, you better get a job. And I said, well, give us a job. And she said, oh, yeah. Already had three other children working there. And, um, and this was a real mongrel job. This was sort of, this was like, this, this show started at 7 o'clock at night and you had to go to the prison every morning to pick up the the requests from the prisoners. And then and so the job started at 7. The two jobs you do not want in a radio station is breakfast because you have to get up to way too early or something like Greenbush where you actually have to stay back late when you can go to the pub, you know what I mean, or, you know have a life so it was a it was a real it was a mongrel job and it was like late night and especially on you know with pension and that sort of stuff a lot of it was right next to a community that had some serious alcohol problems you know what i mean and certain nights there was a lot of ringing for ambulance ring you know knocking on the door people bleeding asking for ambulances and that and I, I, but i did this for about two years this this actual job did but you was yeah it? Oh yeah God, I you know, 16 it. 17 and then I started in the, the video unit. Um, uh, At Karma. Yeah, sort of half 17, 18. And, but, you know, I'm, a, I'm from Alice Springs and I have a lot of community family, but I don't live in a community. You know, I, I, I do have a community, but it's Alice Springs and it's kind of, Alice Springs is slightly, the community is, a little bit, uh, an inch more, not gentrified, but it's just this. This is a this is a really wild community uh, called Little Sisters. We used to live to live next to, and it's it was it's hard. That was hardcore frontline kind of place, and 
I think I, lot of, I learned a lot about humanity doing that show late at night, you know, and about love and respect and yeah. actually you're a DJ but you're actually, you're more than that. You, you take on so many other roles because there's so many missing roles in di- Indigenous communities that are not paid for, that people, nanas, um, granddaughters do that are, uh, they're not, you know what I mean? It's sort of like... They, there's so many roles that are missing because it's just not federally funded or whatever that sort of stuff that are just taken on by people and this is this is two years of my life taking on a role um, that I wasn't cut out to do but learning a lot about um, yeah. being I bet a, you being grew a, a lot bloody that human time. Be, being a good human being yeah. rather than yeah you know it shows you're not you're not you're not there to be a DJ you're there to be a um, you're there to tell to try to transition these people in jail to their communities and to make sure that it's, it's not about you playing the song it's about you telling the community or the community telling the person in jail all this information and becoming a more, more like a, a bush telegraph kind of thing yeah yeah i like that i, I didn't include that clip but there's a line about a, being a boy or a man <laughs> he goes how how am i to know <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah yeah anyway uh can we have a look at a clip from Greenbush. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about it. I haven't seen that film for a very long time. I actually haven't seen any of these for a very long time. No. It's a lovely film. Really Yeah, lovely. and actually, you know, that's actually the first. There's an amazing uh, Torres Strait Islander cinematographer, Murray Louis, who, um, that was his first film, first shot film. Yeah, he shot that for me. Right. Yeah, which is really beautiful. Who's gone on to do amazing things now, Murray. You know what I mean? Yeah. Big TV series and that sort of stuff, yeah. Now, your first feature film as director was quite a triumph. This is Santa and Delilah. Uh, it won the camera door in Cannes, and I hate... I want to remind everybody, including yeah. you, that I <laughs> predicted it before you even left the country. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she slapped me. She slapped me before I left. <laughs> You're going to win. Um, like, now, it's a love story which you said... A romantic in, comedy. In Adelaide, yeah. that it could be about any down-and-out couple, but it couldn't be. It is intrinsically Indigenous, this film. Yeah, totally, but, you know, a different version of it is, you know, two white kids um, on the corner of um, Federation Square, you know what I mean, with some blankets around them. You know what I mean? It's a different story. It's a different collective, you know what I mean? It's a different community, but, you, you know, it's kind of... But you've imbued it with, you know, I mean, you look at this life in this community and the nothingness of Samson's life, you know, being woken by that Cycles, music. yeah, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty simple, you know, just cycles, just cycles. Yeah, but I mean, there's nothing there you know, for him. Just trying to find that one crack where you can just hit it and it gets bigger and bigger like a windscreen and then you can get out. You know what I mean? And there's no crack. It's just you're in this bowl of cycle. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, the duty of care that Delilah has for her grandmother. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's a, a lovely texture to the film about, you know, the nothingness of his life and the duty of care of hers. I always wondered where the parents were. Um... Yeah, so do I. Do you uh, have? You know, th- did I, you have that in your hand? Yeah, well, I, w- I did wonder where they were, and, and and my quick answer was they were drinking. Um, there, there could have been a scene. Actually, there should have been a scene where actually them two are walking through town, and then they see, like either Samson or Delilah sees their parents walking, and they just pass. You know what I mean? And it's sort of like just a recognition and then they just keep... You know what I mean? That could have been quite tragic, but that's hindsight. But, you know... Well, it was pretty perfect film Dad the way it ja- was. Dad could be in jail, Mum could be in hospital, you know what I mean? Doesn't It's not all necessarily about drinking, you know what I mean? It could be... You know, but... It well, could have been something amazing about that, but... I would have had to set them up, the, the parents, earlier in the... In the you know, sorry, this is the writer in me in the structure. Uh, we have to set up the parents because an audience wouldn't understand who they were if it was just like two ships in the night. So there had to be a whole s- more sequences at the beginning, and, uh, or they might have had to come back at the end. Or yeah, 
I don't know. But yeah, Too hard. Don't shy away from the, from the from the ugly side. I no. glue sniffing and the petrol sniffing. It's, but you know, it's, it's, it's kind of one of those films that I had to get off my chest. Uh, I, um, I had to. Oh, I actually don't know. I it, it it was you know, if you want to get noticed, go, go and make them sound to the liar. You know what I mean? It's, <laughs> it's, it's something that you, I know. It's inherent in me through doing Green Bush and all that sort of stuff, and and you know even my family. You know we, you know way before. You know we we spent my my sister Erica um, spent her life. What, what what's that when you look after little kids who, are, you know, from families? Foster. Foster. Every, every Aboriginal family in, in Alice Springs is a foster family. You know what I mean? We just don't get paid for it. You know what I mean? It's just like just a bigger community. Not even not even not even related. You're looking after kids who are not even related. You know what I mean? It's sort of that's just a natural progression of what happens. You know. And so you just grow up that way. So if you're gonna, you know, I I don't think I'd be successful in making. Star Wars because I don't really care and I don't really have a connection where it's you know as your, as your first film hey I'll do a Star Wars right now I need a new swimming pool you know what I mean um, but you know what I mean that's you know that you need when you make your first feature you really do need to understand that you have a truth most people you know your first film your first novel is about your mother you know what I mean you know you write that can because you have that connection and you can write and Samson and Delilah is sort of like my mum in a way it's, I have total pure connection to it I understand I understood it so well that I could do it and I think if I tried to do something completely fictitious that was completely out of my realm or the world that I actually grew up in I think I would have failed quite well you know what I mean yeah, yeah. well I mean I uh, there was one, I, I mean, it's a film of images, really. There's very, not a lot of dialogue in it. Yeah. And there is one scene that I think is completely sublime, and I know that a lot of people think it is too. But can we see this? And I'm, we'll talk about it later, a little bit later. Can we have a look at the... I don't know how many of you have seen Samson and Delilah, but you have to see it before you die. It's one of those. Maury, it is so sublime that that scene. It's, it's funny that scene wasn't written in the the original script. It um, we were I was having trouble with that one little spark. Why the why the f would this beautiful woman have any inkling of him being something special or sexy or you know that one little spark that goes. There's, um, there's something special about him, and that was that. So I wrote that while we were actually shooting that scene. Um, yeah. Whose idea was it that transition of the music, though? Because I mean, that oh, is. Oh, 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 that was you. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> like, I'm not stealing. No, I'm stealing that. <laughs> <laughs> because it. Uh, I mean, I'm. I'm sort of. I'm tearing up watching the bloody thing, you know. And I. I just. I mean, it's just. It's just a gentleness, you know. That's an Anna Gabriella song, which is, and, and she's singing in me Mexican. I have no idea what the words are, and I don't care because I think it's just amazing. It's obviously about love, you know. And you're listening to um, these languages, you know, Arinder and and Pinabi. Actually, no, you're listening to Pinabi, um, and the language, and so suddenly you hear Mexican, and it's kind of like it's. It, it's you don't need subtitles to understand what you know because you're feeling it and I think that's really that was really special for me that there was a pressure to to, to get the Anna Gabriella um, Mexican subtitled and it's like no we don't really you need don't them. need no, them don't it's need not them. you know it's sort of like a, the yeah. music's there yeah you know? the fear of the yeah. unknown you know what I mean yeah, well, sort of like yeah. listening that to Aboriginal language is like for, for can can be the fear of unknown, but when you hear it and it's beautiful, whether it's Mexican or Aboriginal, you don't need subtitles. You don't need to understand. You know when someone's pissed off, and you know when someone's really happy. Yeah, without um, subtitles. Now, once again, I mean, you're the cinematographer and you're the director. 
what would the... Oh, the cinematographer won every award in the world for that one. And the poor old director and writer had to slay their asses off. That's the beginning of, that's <laughs> the, beginning of the journey of um, um, the crushing of the director and the writer to make the cinematographer become almighty and awesome. Yeah. What? Were you... <laughs> was that considered? I'm talking sh- but it's kind of, you know, f- f- what is it, 35 years later, I've realised that this, this egotistical cinematographer has completely crushed these two to make the movies that he wants to make in a strange way. How, I mean, it is a film of very little dialogue. I think Samson says one word in the whole film. Yeah, no, he kind of goes, <laughs> Oh, well, and he has goes, no- And she goes, Hampton. <laughs> yeah. He says Samson. No, she says Samson, I think, and he goes. <laughs> he says Samson. Does he? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, they but very disjointedly, you know. Yeah. Um what are the challenges for you making a film like that? A lot riding on it. Your first feature. Yeah. As director, so you've got your director hat on there and your yeah. cinematographer's eye through yeah. that lens. Yeah. Talk about it. Well, it was all it was all given to the cinematographer. I had the best Panavision, Panagold, Super 35 mil, you know, the best image capture around with these beautiful vintage lenses. And that was all given to... But I've forsaken that any grips or gaffers so I didn't have anybody to help light it or anybody to help make the the camera move anywhere um so it was kind of you know a lot of the money of that film was actually spent on the image you know the the the, the camera to capture the image because I knew that what was, what was going to be in front of the camera not necessarily was expensive but I knew I was going to get that you know, yeah. So I didn't need money to have that mountain range or those two, those two incredible actors, and to have oh, that story. Just but I needed ridiculous two. amounts of money for that camera. You know, so so the cinematographer won again. So you spent a lot of money on the yeah. <laughs> on that camera. Yeah, and the process afterwards. Well, you got to go where your heart is. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I want to win that AFI. I have to win that AFI. No, yeah. but you know, I thought it was interesting. You were, you were talking about winning the camera door. Well, I was talking about when you winning the camera door, and and there was this talk about the fact that it should actually have been in competition in Cannes. Yeah, and, and it would have won. It, they it, reckon. Well, a lot of people said if it was yeah. in competition in Cannes, it would have won the Palm Door, and they were complaining about why it wasn't. And the the the, the amazing two amazing directors of Khan said that Warwick wouldn't have been able to handle the competition. You know what I mean? The pressure of the competition. It's like, ugh, boring. <laughs> a lot of other people haven't been able to. I mm. mean, really, you put your films in competition in Khan and the whole, you know, it, it's a, yeah. an enormous stage on which to, you know, screen your film. Yeah. Yeah. It's pressure, really. Yeah, and it, and, and, it, and it doesn't balance very well. You know what I mean? There's a certain amount that just goes, Yeah. There's a certain amount that just go genius. Yeah. And there's, there's no grey in between when you get into competition in calm. It's either oh. part of or it's the best thing ever made in the history of cinema. So you've got to... Look... Um, not good on your first film. You know, I mean, Samson and Delal, all your films are films of images, really. Um, but Samson and Delilah particularly so I think it, it, it's told through images and the thing is it's such a rough journey this film it is really tough and you let us off at the end with something truly beautiful and I want that scene if we can see that scene I don't know whether you've seen it but it's it's sort of like it's really lovely that smile on Delilah's face at the end just broke me up. I yeah. just think it's one of the... And, you know, it's, a, it's important because it could have, could have quite easily been a, a complete tragedy. 
but yeah. when you think about these two kids and the, the crap that I've put them through by writing that story, how dare I make it a tragedy? You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, when you let everybody off the hook, actually. Like, yeah, the writers as well. The, the, them, they need to be off the hook. There's something, you know what I mean? They fought so hard to survive. How dare some auteur wanker <laughs> turn their lives into a tragedy? You, you know what I mean? It. They're allowed to survive and they're allowed to, to have grandchildren. Yeah, yeah. I'm very grateful to you, actually, for that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, well, you know, I don't watch that anymore. It's too, it's too horrific for me. It's too what? Well, you know, it's, 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 it, it, it hurts every time I see that film, so... It yeah. hurts everybody. Yeah. It's not easy. No, it's not. No, so I, I kind of don't watch it much. Well, but I haven't it, watched it for probably 10 years. Right, well, it's beautiful. I, mm. I, and I've watched it recently, no. and I just want... Yeah. I'll introduce it. The other, um, the tomorrow is it tomorrow or the next day? It's Sunday. Thank you. All um, right, you've got a chance to see it here. We're good. No, I'll introduce it, but I'll, 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 I won't watch it. No, but everybody else has a chance to watch it. Yeah, no, yeah, 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 and yeah, yeah. What I'm doing you is say, it, don't it's miss it. It's tough, but it's beautiful. Well, there's masochists out there. I've seen it about four or five <laughs> times or something. So. Oh, fault. I've seen it a number of times, and yeah. I'm, I don't consider myself a masochist. <laughs> Maybe I do. But uh, the next film, Sweet Country. Hey. Now, now, where did that come from? Um, true story uh, about a, a, an old man named Little Bit of Jack. A little Bit of Jack? No. Um, David Trainer's family's... David Trainer, who, who, who sound recorded basically every single film, Aboriginal, Aboriginal black, Ali Wara, that's his... That's his that's his tribe, his language. Uh, about his his great great grandfather, and he's a sound recorder. So he's always kind of on all of my films. It's like, hey, brother, I've got a really good story there. Yeah, real good one. And, and I'm, I'm like, oh, here we go. I go, oh, go on then, David. You should write it. And he's like, hey, true. No, oh, I can't write. Yeah, he's sitting waiting for me to write his <laughs> film. You know what I mean? He's like, nah, come on, you can do it. And he's like, hey. And, said, and so he did, <laughs> and uh, um, so he did write a script, and it was terrible. <laughs> but he wrote it because he thought that his grandparents' story was more important than his lack of knowledge of scripts or spelling or whatever. You know what I mean? So empowering, so important. And then from there, it's like, but the heart was there. You know what I mean? The nuances of a script, you know what I mean? La, 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 la. You know what I mean? There's, there's people you can, who tell you you can write a, write a film in 28 days, all that kind of stuff, and they can teach you all that crap. So we, we paired him up with Steve McGregor, who's an amazing Indigenous writer, and they write this film. And um, and they, actually, this is kind of... I was, I was a bit of a hired gun for this, in a way. It was developed on the ether of who I, where I am and what I do. You know what I mean, and and then when I read the script that David and and Stephen had had created, I was like, oh, I want to shoot that. I want to shoot that. You know, I want to direct that. Well, I mean, shoot it. So, <laughs> <laughs> and that yeah, that's how it happened. And that's that's how that film happened. Well, one of the things that you know I've noticed is this um, magical quality of Indigenous people on screen. Now, Gulpal had it in spades. I oh. mean, there is not an appearance he makes on screen that isn't, you know, absolutely yeah. eye-drawing. Um, but there are so many of them. And, and you know, um, there's this one wonderful performance from Hamilton Morris yeah. in, your, in this film as the hunted man. Yeah. But before that, I wanted to go to a, a scene from the film that... Well, I think it's really central to what the film is about. Beautiful writing from David, eh? Mm. Special. Yeah. Important. Well, I I sort of thought it encapsulated a lot of what this film's about, and it's about also about what you're about as a filmmaker. You reckon? Yeah, I do. There was <laughs> one thing, you know, it's, I sort of read quite a lot about what you'd said and stuff. And it's almost like your people know this country like 
no one else does. And in fact, what I feel you want to do is share that knowledge. Yeah, that's pretty, yeah, it's, it's pretty, yeah, totally, but that's all Indigenous people in a way, you know what I mean? If you've got knowledge, you you share what you're allowed to share and you obviously keep secret and sacred what you're not allowed to because that's just as powerful, you know what I mean? And you just, you know, you could write the Oxford Dictionary on Indigenous everything and it just kind of would water down who we are. You know what I mean? So there's a, there's a balance through all of that sort of stuff that you need to do. The secret and the sacred has to be balanced with the power of giving people knowledge and telling people we do have knowledge and power. You know what I mean? It's a, it's just a really weird, but I don't know what I'm saying, but it's kind of... Yeah, no, I'm... Well, I'm it's, it's, everything's a balance, you know, as we were saying before. I get in trouble with my community all the time, but I'm the person who probably... I can f I, I'm n not fearless because I'm scared <laughs> of my community, um, but I, I'm strong enough to go. Ah, f this, this is all wrong. What we're doing here is just so wrong. You know what I mean? And and get angry with my people just as much as get angry with external things that help um, simmer the problems in our communities. You know what I mean? So well. External poisons and internal poisons, and it's sort of like, you know, you need to talk about both of those. I just think that, that things have changed, and I think that certainly white people in this country are now realising how much they have to learn from Indigenous culture. And that's been, you know, it was nothing to begin with. And now it is, I think it's significant. And I think it's that's what's changed. I think, I think we were very fortunate when in the eighties and that when we really started. There was a bigger push into 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 cinema through shorts and new directors and and older directors. That people started realizing that that, that, that what they read in the history books, whether it was primary school or high school, slightly a little bit less in university, but. We were we were these movies were actually writing. They were history books rather. They were they were doing those kind of you know it's like the the idea that you get a radio station but actually you need a community center and you need a health clinic more than you need a radio station. You know what I mean? You need you need a primary school more than you need a radio station. But hey, let's give them all radio stations. Not um you know not the proper real foundation, foundations of community that, you know, they were lacking in a strange way, but, you know, it's kind of like, well, for, for a wider audience in Australia, they were lacking the history books to tell the right stories, and then suddenly you're using cinema to write bloody history books, you know what I mean, to try and re realign history and tell our point of view and our version, rather than it being a, a book that's taught in primary school or in high school it's this bloody movie that you know that's, that's starting to do the same job and it's kind of a really interesting dynamic using something we all want to be entertained but I'll never tell you that I'm educating you at the same time you know what I mean it's like hey bells and whistles it's all going to be fun and games you know what I mean but actually there's a d deep core foundation of education and that's what you know that's what you want to make Star Wars, but you have to make Samson and Delilah. You know what I mean? Because you don't that's make more Star important. Wars. Don't give me that. No, I need a swimming pool. No, um, no, you know what I mean? I was trying to say, you want, I want to make Star Wars, but actually I have to make Samson and Delilah because it's much more f important, you know? Because it's much more, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's more about education and history and, and entertainment than just pure popcorn. Yeah. We were going to look at another clip from... Um Sweet Country, which is Hamilton Morris, talking about Indigenous performance on screen, mm -hmm. you know, and I mean, I don't know what it is, there's a naturalness about so many Indigenous performers in film yeah. that, you know, I mean, out, fairly generally outdoes a lot of the, the white performances. 
Oh, I don't know. It's just, you know, I don't know. There's, I think there's, you know, Hamilton and Rowan or Marissa have a connection purely to that. You know what I mean? They, they're, they're not playing a queen, you know, covered in white paint in 1762 as an actor. They're playing the role of what they actually did for the rest of their whole f life. You know what I mean? They've actually, they're... Their then their nighter version of this is just living, you know what I mean, to actually play that role. So there's kind of this real, there is a connection to, there's a really interesting connection that's actually through actually just being Aboriginal that can play that these kind of roles. Can we have a look at the next clip from Sweet Country with Hamilton Morris? Um, and he's the hunted man and this is him at his trial. I think Matt Day gives, doesn't give a bad performance. Matt Day you? rocks. Yeah. yeah. It's a lovely performance from him. Yeah. Yeah. He, um, yeah, he was pretty amazing on that whole film. Before we go to something else, the importance of landscape in your films. It's interesting with that one there. I, you know, like Samson Delay was shot on Super 35. That was the first digital feature I'd ever shot using these uh, Ari Alexa proper anamorphic lenses and that sort of stuff, but it was the first digital. And, you know, I was such a, I spent my life trying to get away, you know, in the 80s, running away from video to shoot film, to be the ego DP rock star, you know, I, I shoot film, you know. Um, and spend my life fighting to shoot on film, fighting to shoot on film, and then suddenly film's dead, you know, long live film. And then I made this here, and I just found found that you know I could have detested digital, and I found it's so refreshingly relieving to shoot you know digital again. Well, you know I came from I came from Umatic Beta Cam, Super 16, Super 35, and then going back to you know zero and one digital data. Um, Bit different from beta can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I just found it so refreshing. I felt that I could play again. Just shooting something in Alice Springs would take probably around about a ten day turnaround to see rushes to get a you know, a tick of approval, a neg a neg um report saying, you know, colour okay, focus okay, scratches none. You know what I mean? That kind of basic this this dreaded piece of paper that you'd get from the lab would take ten days. So you'd always have to have everything completely on standby to, you might need to reshoot it again. It might have a huge scratch through the whole thing. So shooting digital became, I was like, and then I felt really bad for me as a cinematographer that I actually liked this stuff. Because it was, you know, the, the, it's like, oh, you're, you're, you're cheating now. You're, you know what I mean? It's, it's become easy again. And it ha it has its complications, and it has its diff it has a, a very different way to, to to think cinematically, you know. Um, and composition's the same, but just the process of how it, how zeros and ones work compared to you know chemicals. And um, I I really enjoyed it, and then I felt like a fraud. <laughs> Going back to you know Trish Carhill, the, the, who's a colorist who has done all of my films. Um, who's a abs she's a genius, you know what I mean? I, I completely hide behind her and she saves my ass every single shot, you know? And, and it's kind of, you know, and with this stuff, it's just become so much easier and, ex and exciting because I can play a little, I think I can play a little bit more. It's, it's less technical, so it could become much more creative in a way. Anyway, well, there's that little bit of cinematography we we were going to well, talk about. Well, it's in the genes because Dylan, your son Dylan River, ah. worked on this as well, didn't he? Yeah, that little bastard. Because he said to me at he one stole, stage, all the really beautiful shots in the film are his. Yeah, I can't. <laughs> I'm, li I'm lying, but I, I don't. No, 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 no. All the reshoots are his. I had to, I had to reshoot everything he shot. <laughs> no, I didn't. But he's he's stealing my jobs, and he's so he's stealing my money. <laughs> <laughs> and he's starting to steal all my awards, so it's sort of like, you know. He's very talented. I wiped your ass for, <laughs> for three years, and now you're taking well, my Well, I think we've got to get to audience questions, but before we do that, 
we're going to go to a, a just a smidgen of a clip uh, from God knows what is it 1988. 1998, well, no, 1998, 1990. 1990. So that's sort of like six, nearly seven. a quarter of a century ago when Warwick and I were very much younger and I shot an interview with him when he was shooting Radiance. And this is the young Warwick, at, what, 26? Teeth, everything. <laughs> yeah. How has it been? I mean, has it been a rewarding experience with Rachel? Absolutely. Yeah, I, um, I've, I've, I've learned so much, you know what I mean? Especially with all sorts of strange things. Health, health in general, looking after yourself on a feature film is, you know, is bloody, is bloody hard work, you know, just, and mentally and physically. And, and, you know, having Rachel there is an incredibly strong woman, you know, it's, it's been really good. You know? She sorts me out occasionally. And, starting to fall to pieces. Yeah. Well, I suppose it's, it is a physically demanding thing of you. That, you know, six weeks of very mm. intense work. Mm. What do you do to look after you? Do you just got to, what do you do? Um, eat well, sleep well. Sleeping is just the most important thing in the world. You know, you're doing 10, 12 hours, you know, and you're doing, on location, you're doing six day weeks. Um, so, you, you know, you just, that, that's it. And mentally, you know, preparing yourself every day, reading the script at night. Yeah, and just all sorts of all sorts of things. Keeping in the book, good books with everybody, you know, first time DOP and having grips and gaffers, of, you know, Paul and Greg have done everything from resistance to, to you know, um, um, death in Brunswick. You know, they're having having them there, they sort of look after you as well. You know, our mate will look after you. You know, which is really good. Cool. <laughs> still wearing a still wearing a bloody polo. <laughs> that's, a, that's a little bit of cinematography, isn't it? A polo. Did you get a hard time from the groups and what were they? Greg Molino, Greg Molino, who's um, one of the last pirates in cinema. There's, there's two different kinds of groups. There's a, there's, um, there's a gentleman group of today, and then there's pirates of of the past. And he's a, he, he was a classic pirate. His truck was painted black. The whole thing, you know what I mean? <laughs> Skull and crossbones on yeah. the side. And. Um, we had a, we had a, we had a, um, we all went to, we were in 1770, the town, Angus Waters, you know, up in the Queenslandy kind of thing. And I walked in, you know, we all landed and all the crew were there and we went, we, 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 I went to the pub, you know, to one, one pub town, five horses, one pub. And I walked up to him and go, hi, I'm Warwick, uh, you know, I'm the DP and he's like, fuck mate, I'm drinking. <laughs> 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 like, oh, okay. <laughs> that's the kind of that's the kind of hardcore the, the way they in, well, yeah. it's the industry yeah, tough the guys. industry it was, it was rape and pillage you know what I mean and the trucks would rock up and they'd destroy a town and you know and then keep moving on it's, you know it's, it's sort of a <laughs> Mad Max era of film of, of everybody of in, that era yeah, yeah. yeah would you, any of you like to ask Warwick a question Is this? Oh, yes. Warwick, is there a pet project or a film you haven't made yet you would like to do? Huh? I, um, okay, I'm going, I'm going to go through the whole gamut of, I'm going to make one movie of every single genre bar romantic comedies. <laughs> or musicals. I reckon I've, you know, you know, um, I, don't, I don't think I'd be able to make a musical and I don't think I'd be able to make a romantic comedy. But, uh, there's a film that I'm about to do uh, in South Australia with um, with an amazing actor called Kate Blanchett. Uh, I wrote that before Samson Delilah, and so it's that's literally a 21 year process. The script was <laughs> when I first wrote it, so you know there's a reason why it's taken this long. <laughs> but it's it is it is a pet project. It's called New Boy. It's about a young, a young Aboriginal boy who's sort of plucked out of the desert and taken to an orphanage in sort of the wheat belt, South Australia, you know, uh, run by a, a rock star, crazy nun. And you know who that obviously will be, you know what I mean? So yeah, it's, it, it is a pet project. It's taken a very, very long time to get up. Originally, it was about a, a priest and this boy 
but I know that if you walk to if you walk to a cinema and you've seen a poster of a priest and a little Aboriginal boy, and it was a film by Warwick Thornton, I don't think you'd fucking go and watch that. You know, <laughs> you know and it's not about that creepy. <laughs> it's actually it's about awesome people. You know what I mean? Who do amazing things and and don't know why they're doing them. Anyway, but yeah, so it's a pet project that actually has come to tuition, on, and I'm shooting, and it should, should be out um, March next year. Yeah. But I've got a science fiction film. I want to make some, you know what I mean? Well, it's not Star Wars. It's, it's, it's called The Seventh Sister, which is a very exciting one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, lots, you know, you have, when you when you write, you have, you, have, you have a film that you can make for 50 bucks and you have a film that you can make for 50 million, you know what I mean? And then you kind of like, they're like aces up your sleeve and it's sort of like, with the right time, and you kind of go, here's one I prepared earlier, you know what I mean? You know, that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, there's, there's a couple of scripts, but the, the new boy one is the really, really special one that I'm really excited about. Yeah. Yeah. You're at the front. I'm yes. sorry, I should repeat Marcia. the question. Hi, Marcia, how are you going? How are you? Oh, very well, my sister. Uh, in retrospect, how do you feel about the beach, you know, and the impact of it? Um, the question was, well, how does he feel about the beach and the impact of it? Yeah. Oh. You know, I, that, the beach was made on a three-page outline, and it, it uh, NITV read three pages and it, was, and it ended with, I kind of know what I'm doing, but I don't know what I'm doing. You know what I mean? We'll just, we'll just put me in this situation and, and see what happens. And they, they have the foresight of going, yeah, totally, you know? And that was really special to be backed by, you know, black fellas in that way. And, and then really push SBS to get money and, and really push Screen Australia to get some money and that sort of stuff. And I was pretty burnt out. That's the whole reason of it. It's like, you know, go and sit down and and um, chillax and, and re, re-get my mind together. And I got my son, Dylan, to shoot it. And actually, it became incredibly stressful preparing for it because it's like, why the do you want to stand in front of a camera? You know what I mean? That's just the most worst place to ever be is to that kind of pressure. You know, I think actors are incredibly weird. They're a very special alien. They were all, every single actor once stood and looked in a mirror and said, yeah, I'm going to stand in front of that camera. I just don't understand that. Anyway, here decided to do the same thing, you know, and I'm not an actor. Um, and so there was so much pressure at the beginning and the actual shooting because my son directed it um, he, no i directed it he shot it i think there was this kind of we had this symbiotic kind of you know th- so all the stories i was kind of telling the camera but i was actually telling my son about me being and doing stupid things and the fear and cutting myself and you know wanting to stab people and all those wonderful things that we do in life but we never do or maybe we do um that kind of i was kind of talking to my son because he was there with the camera and i thought i felt i felt that was incredible that was more healing the shoot was really healing and then because i i directed it it started again the ego started again so you know sort of oh don't use that shot look at your guts you know what i mean and sort of Oh, the vanity, the massive amount of vanity that came into the edit, you know what I mean, about who, what I wanted people to look, visually look at me, you know what I mean? I think the, the stories I was telling were really important, they were strong because I was telling them to my son, but then suddenly when we started editing, my vanity and, the, who, who, you know, what I look like and uh, no teeth and, <laughs> and beer belly and hair like that and a beard like that there, it's sort of... I started dictating and then I had to leave the edit and let um, Andrea, the editor, who's incredibly amazing, take over because my vanity was taking over the whole story, you know, and I was, I was wrecking my own movie with my ego. Why do you think I never shot me in interviews? <laughs> yeah, exactly, the reversal, <laughs> yeah, the classic, yeah, absolutely. Is, 
Oh, there's a question, and it might be the last one, unfortunately. Sorry. <laughs> uh, when you uh, write a scene or read someone else's scene, are you filming it in your head? Um, yeah. This, this different, it depends. Because I, 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 I find, because I can't write, I can't spell, and I use just pen and paper, because computers are like, that's just science fiction. You know what I mean? I, I have to. Uh, so when I write, I, 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 I'm literally thinking of a film for about a year before I'll even actually put. In the beginning, you know what I mean? That I, before that, I've got literally the whole arc of the main character, beginning, middle, and end, you know, in my head. And, you know, all the nuances aren't there, but it's just that this happens, this happens, this happens, this happens. So and then I'll just write, I'll sit and write, scene one. Black fellow walks into a bar. You know what I mean? His name is so-and-so, and that's all I'll write. It's literally one line, of, you know, like the, you know, you get the A4 and you got all the little blue lines, kind of shit. Or just scene one, and then only use that one line to say what that scene is. And then scene two, and then only use that one line, and then just go right through the whole script. And I have to do that because I just find it so painful. You know what I mean? And I'm not sort of like, I don't have an idea. I'm just going to start writing right now. It's no way. Everything is structurally completed in my head. So I've gone through a year of visualising every shot and every scene and the location and, the, and the, the whether it's summer, winter, spring or autumn. Everything about it has been completely visualised in my head. And... And it and just writing is and it's just a, it's just like a process. So I can I can write a feature in a week. You know what I mean? Ten pages a day, seven days. That's seventy pages. It's done. You know? And then and then from there it'll open up because it's pretty. Shit. It's a pretty grip. But then I can open it up and get the nuances and the beauty and the subtleties and rebuilding dialogue and that sort of stuff. I'm not big on dialogue. You know what I mean? I sort of. It's, I'd rather play a country, uh, you know, Charlie Pride song than get the actors to talk. You know what I mean? Um, and then when I'm reading other people's stuff, it's kind of oh, I don't know. You, you've, 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 I'm, I'm hard on myself, and I give other people who've, who've written stuff much bigger chances. And you know what I mean? To try and get understand what they're trying to, you know what I mean? I don't necessarily have to be hooked in the first five pages, you know what I mean? Because I believe that um, our lives aren't sound bites, and we, you know what I mean? So, you know, it's a, well, that's the beautiful thing about cinema. When you choose to buy a ticket and you go into the cinema and you watch the first 20, you go, oh my God, this is shit. <laughs> but you'll stay. You won't leave. One, it costs you 25 bucks, but two, it's a comfortable place and you're safe, you know what I mean? Whereas, you know, streaming, it's sort of like, you know, 30 seconds in, oh, this you know what I mean? It's like the buffet, you know what I mean? It's like, why on my plate have I got some Chinese, some roast potatoes and some, you know, baked lamb with um, some sushi? You know what I mean? It's sort of like that really weird buffet idea of streaming and that's why you're so, you've got to walk into, you know, I spend more time trying to find something to watch on a streamer than I do, you know, Whereas I will prepare personally to go to the movies and I will prepare, I will hear about this movie and I'll think about that movie and I'll check the times and then I will invest my money and then I will invest my time and I will let the film and the, the writer and the director and lo and behold that wanker, the cinematographer, let me go on that journey, you know what I mean? And I'll stay and I'll give my respect to the filmmakers and the story and the characters, you know? It's a really weird thing, you know? And that's the beauty of cinema, is that we, we love it so much that we respect it and we will stay even if the first 20 minutes is because it, it's the long players and characters need time, you know what I mean? They need time to develop in your, in your mind and, and on that screen and they need to be rejected or embraced through the arc of storytelling and that's the sad thing about streaming at the moment, the buffet. We, you know, binge drinking's really bad and binge eating's really bad, so why the f 
binge screening good for you? You know what I mean? What, what, what's all that about? Hey, yeah, I binged 27 hours of, you know, Game of Thrones. It's like, do you remember the last 18 hours of that? You know what I mean? No, you didn't. It's just, you know, so it's, it's bad for you. And that's why I still love cinema. And I, that's why I love storytelling. And that's why when I read something that's, sorry, long <laughs> story. <isn't it? laughs> that's why if someone else has written something, I really have to invest. I know what I've done. I know what I've written because I've invested a year in it of thinking about it. So I'm happy to do that. But when I read something from someone else, I have to invest really, really strongly. And, t you know, it's not like you pick a book up and you read a couple of pages and then you put it down and you go to sleep. And then on the train, you read five pages. No way. I literally have to put a day away for someone's script. And it's sort of like no TV, no, everyone's off. You know what I mean? I'm just, there's their script. I need to invest and get right to the end and focus as, as, as closely as possible. And then I can say, oh my God, they're geniuses, or I can say, no, that's, shit. that's a shit script. I'm not going to go anywhere near it. Yeah. We've Anna. What, yeah, Anna. We're over time, that's but Anna. this has got to be the last nah, question. Nah, yeah, it's Anna. Anna. Anna's going to have the best question in the world. You watch. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, you've worked in the and worked in Yeah. Yeah. And what's your relationship to the different forms and, and their content and their possibilities? So the question was, uh, you've worked in photography, uh, video yeah. and... Uh, cinema. And cinema. And yeah. um, what's the, your attitude towards the different forms? Uh, I, I have three. I, I have three of the greatest ideas for a movie every single day. You know what I mean? But it's the, the best. You know, we're going to win every single award, like a zillion dollars, and just you know, be the greatest filmmaker in the history of everything. What a lot of shit. You know what I mean? But I do have those three ideas, which are every day. And you have to understand that this this film I'm about to do is 20, 20 years in the making. Now, if you bottle that up and you didn't make a movie for twenty years, and this was the only thing you're ever going to go, you'll go mad. You know what I mean? You'll be out there. You'll be out there. You know, running naked in the street and you know, robbing Seven Elevens by by the end of the first three years. So you need creatively to have multiple output out, outlets. And I found myself really early after sort of Samson Delilah and the you know the Khan win and all that sort of stuff becoming so blinkered about cinema and filmmaking and how important it is and how important I am and it's like it's you need to have multiple creative outlets so photography is incredibly important to me it's instant I can have an idea I can have an idea and I can and I need to think well do I want to go down a 10-year process with that idea it's fleeting I just had it on the corner of the, of, of the street you know and it's like do you really want to go down 10 years for an idea you just had 30 seconds ago and you had three of them a day? You know what I mean? But that idea doesn't have to be a, 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 a movie. It could be a, a, a stills photograph. It could be a country and western song. Grab a piece of paper and write a country and western song. You know what I mean? She won't buy me beers so the flies are drinking my tears. You know what I mean? There's so many great outlets that are not necessarily this sort of auteur cinema wanker f process you know what i mean and they all deserve they all deserve to be told just so i go through a great process of every idea of what is it is it a you know is it a newly designed sprinkler is it a country and western song is it a photograph is it a is it a meal is it a, you know is it a you know Italian Japanese fusion <laughs> you know it they're all creative and so you need I need multiple ones just to burn energy and ideas so photography and um video um video art is it, video, is it called video art I don't know is that, yeah. a, is that a word yeah you do yeah video art yeah hi I'm Mark Thorne um <laughs> Just as many outlets as possible, and you don't. And, and what's the most awesome thing is when you go, Oh my god, this isn't a movie, it's a country and western song. F I don't know any chords. What a beautiful journey! It's a new journey. Okay, I'm gonna, 
you can either Google it or, you know what I mean? Need to buy a guitar if they want to be a country and western singer. <laughs> well, there's a the beginning. You know what I mean? It's kind of, that's, it's, you know, 40, 52, 42, wish. 52 years of age. I'm learning some country and western chords because, hey, if this cinema can work, I'm going to torture you all with the greatest country and western songs ever. Well, I yeah. think we can look forward to that. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Warwick, honestly, you've been so generous and gorgeous talking about everything that means Wasn't stuff much to you. light and cinematography in that, was there, eh? <laughs> you know, but, yeah. Well, thank God you're a cinematographer because you've given us some most beautiful images over the years. Thank God and thank you're God a country you've boy. gone into directing because you've given us some bloody good films, too. Thank you. No thank way, you guys. very thank much you. for coming. Thank you, Warwick. That was terrific. Thank you.